Good afternoon. So good to be here and so excited about Aviation Week and what that means to uh, our campus, to our university. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for us to celebrate uh, all things aviation. And after all, that's what this place is about. So uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun uh, planning this and uh, thinking about the kinds of things that would interest you, our students, uh, and making sure we're providing that kind of programming so that you know, so that it interests you and benefits you uh, in some really nice ways. So we have, as we do tonight, a, a very high level speaker is gonna be our kickoff uh, event for this. We have a plane pull. By the way, the agenda for Aviation Week is all over the place, you can't miss it. So uh, a trivia night, simulator experiences and a right flyer. Uh, we'll have chalk art, we'll have much, much more. Uh, and we're going to have some really nice prizes this year uh, that we're introducing uh, for the winners and those who uh, do really well in these events and participate. Uh, but you do have to show up to win, so plan on uh, plan your calendars accordingly and come and uh, take part in all the fun. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So thanks for showing up this afternoon. You will not be disappointed. I promise you that. Uh, and before I, uh, before I uh, get going here, I just want to recognize uh, one uh, VIP that we have in the room, an Embry-Riddle VIP, and that's the provost, Lon Moeller, uh, who's standing in the back. And he's my boss, and he's the best provost at uh, Embry-Riddle, so we're, we're happy to have him. <laughs> So to kick off Aviation Week, we have none other than Embry-Riddle alum and our very good friend, Chairman and CEO of Airbus Americas, Jeff Niddle. And I just want to set the stage a little uh, for some of the things you're going to be hearing tonight and uh, kind of describe his qualifications a little bit, uh, because they are indeed impressive. So in addition to the CEO title, he is the head of region for the Americas and as such reports directly to the Airbus CEO. He's responsible for Airbus commercial aircraft business throughout the Americas, as well as providing leadership for the company's market leading helicopter business and its space and defense unit in North America. Additionally, Jeff chairs A3 by Airbus some of you may not be aware of this. This is the company's Silicon Valley-based innovation arm. He's a board member of Airbus Ventures, which scouts and invents, invests in early stage technologies across the globe. And he is a member of the Airbus Canada Limited Partnership Board, a multi-billion dollar joint venture of Airbus. Bombardier and the province of Canada, of Quebec rather, to procure parts, assemble, and market the world's most modern commercial aircraft, the A220. Airbus Americas does more than you think. With more than 5,000 employees, Airbus Americas encompasses the regional corporate offices, engineering and innovation centers, training facilities, MROs, and spare parts distribution centers, imagery and drone services. I don't know how you keep track of all this, Jeff. As well as large scale manufacturing facilities producing commercial aircraft, helicopters and satellites. Jeff has more than 35 years of experience in aerospace and transportation finance. Before joining Airbus, Jeff was CEO of C2 Aviation Capital, a global leasing company focused on acquiring, leasing, and managing commercial aircraft. He is in great demand to serve on prestigious boards, and he's on numerous of them, and he does a lot of volunteer work uh, in the industry and outside the industry as well. So that's a little about him. Interviewing Jeff this afternoon is our own Madison Seymour. Madison. <laughs> Madison is a second year undergraduate student at Embry-Riddle pursuing a bachelor's degree in aeronautical science with a minor in airline operations. On campus, she serves as a resident advisor for the housing department, the social media chair for Embry-Riddle's women in aviation chapter, 
She's a general manager of Alpha Omicron Alpha Aeronautical Honor Society, and she is a student in the honors program. Madison currently is pursuing her certified flight instructor certificate and hopes to fly for an airline or a corporate flight department. Being a first generation pilot and relying on various mentors, a very smart thing to do, to guide her way into the aviation community, she strives to reciprocate the same support for her peers and the upcoming generation. I'd like to invoke, invite both uh, Madison and Jeff to come forward and uh, take your positions, and I'll turn it over to Madison for the rest of the program. I would like to remind our audience uh, that this event is being recorded uh, so that future so, uh, people unable to attend tonight have an opportunity to see this. So it will be recorded, and I turn it over to both I of you. I just have a question. Yes, sir. Is take your positions part of the speedway, or is this a... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank you for the introduction. And I also want to thank um, Jeff for coming over here today um, and be willing to share your knowledge with um, all of the students that are here today. Um, so to start off, uh, we kind of talked about, um, Dean Solzer talked about your experience in history um, within the aviation industry. You have 35 years of experience. Um, so just kind of on that path, I would love to hear about what your career path looked like along the way, maybe some challenges you faced. Um, and how you prevailed from those, and how you got to your position today, being the CEO of Airbus America. Well, 35 years is a long story, but uh, we'll, we'll try and make it short. Um, as as you know, I'm a graduate of Embry Riddle, um, and when I was at Embry Riddle, and actually thinking about coming to Embry Riddle, it was all about love for aviation, which I think all of you have. I mean, one of the cool things about Embry Riddle is most, if not all, the people that you talk to have a similar love. Now, it may be in air traffic management, it may even be in space, it may be in a lot of different things, but you all have that, that common interest. And that's really what I was looking for. So I came here to Embry Riddle, that they had a program back then, I don't think it exists today, it was called a co op program, which is similar to an internship. Um, I got the opportunity to work for Cessna Finance at the time. Uh, went up to North Carolina, um, then back here for my senior year, and they hired me, shockingly. Um, and then I got the opportunity really to, to have some fun and start to learn about the you know, commercial, not the commercial, the corporate aviation business, and actually the general aviation business. So I did that for a few years, and um, they wanted to promote me and said, okay, we're gonna give you an airplane and you're gonna be a regional rep and you're just gonna fly around and demonstrate airplanes and sell airplanes to people. And um, I told them that was a wonderful idea, except I wasn't a pilot. Um, they thought because I went to Embry-Riddle that I was a pilot automatically. So they were kind enough to actually pay for um, my pilot's license. So. I started flying, loved it, had a, had a great time, um, was covering really the whole northeast of the, of the U.S., um, and then moved into, uh, had an opportunity, and this is where relationships matter, someone recommended me uh, for another job, mainly because my then fiance, although I thought running around having your own airplane and an expense account and all these neat things was um, perfect, she thought it was perfect for a single guy, not someone who was about to get married. So um, I moved on to the, to the leasing business, which was really a, a small business at that time. Um, I think it had a 1% market share. Um, and I, I would, one of the learnings I would, I would tell you all is when you get into businesses, especially if they're not, um, you know, developed businesses, you're looking at smaller businesses, Think about what the size of the future opportunity was. Because I can look at it and say, I got into a business with a 1% market share that ended up with a 50% market share. And when that happens, you have, you, you can make mistakes and still do well. Because the growth of the industry overwhelms mistakes, if that makes sense. 
So it's really important to get what I call the macro right when, when you're getting started. So, so think about that as, as you go forward. Um, we, after 30 some years, we sold the business to the Chinese and, and I retired. Um, uh, I was around for about six months and my wife failed my retirement, I think, and said, you should go back to work. So I went to work for, for Airbus. I, um, we were at the time I retired one of Airbus's and Boeing's actually largest clients. So my relationships, and I use that term again, were very, very strong. Um, Airbus reached out to me and said, geez, would you like to do this? And I've done it and it's been great. Airbus is a great company to work for and we can talk about that, but um, it's been a lot of fun. So long story longer. Okay, perfect, <laughs> thank you. You talked a little bit about your mistakes, or not your mistakes specifically, just about mistakes along the way. Um, you know, as a student um, and as myself, I make you know mistakes on the daily. So I was wondering how you, um, what mistakes you have faced, and then also how you combated those to get um, to aid towards your success. Today. So um, as as you move through your careers, you become more confident about making mistakes. If that makes sense, uh, because you know you don't know everything. When I was your age, it was really important for me to, quote unquote, know everything, and if not, pretend I knew it. So what I realized is that the real value was admitting I didn't know something so I could learn it. And then also, when you make a mistake, analyze it. It's so easy to pretend things are gonna work out. And that's true in life and it's true in business. You know, usually your gut tells you right away that this is not good. And a lot of times our natural tendency is to hope. You know, this is gonna get better, let's just you know, keep going on, it'll, it'll work out. And I think the, the reality is as you, um, are more involved in, in, in business and, and in life through, through age, you realize it's better just to address these things head on, um, analyze your mistakes, and move forward. Because you also realize that all the people you know have had made similar mistakes. There's nobody that's foolproof. It's, it's the people that admit it, learn from it, and move on that really advance in, in business, in, in my opinion, and in life. Well, that's really reassuring to hear, you know, uh, as we go through our college careers and then progress on to the more of uh, the industry, you know, those will be happening and uh, it's just how you recover from it and then that's how you become successful. You, you want to be um, what I term factually optimistic, right? How many of you like to hang around pessimistic people? You know, the world's ending, you know, did you raise your hand back there? Or I, <laughs> I think the reality is, I think we all want to be around positive, optimistic people. That doesn't mean people who make stuff up, but a natural optimism that you're going to get things done, um, that, that things are going to improve, it, it just makes things, things easier. So I, I just think that's fundamental as, um, as you work your way through, through business. Yeah. Well, that's a great transition into this next question. I was just going to ask, um, as you have a lot of the young professionals and um, upcoming uh, next generation of um, professionals in the aviation industry sitting in this crowd right here, um, we would love to hear about what we can do right now to better prepare for the industry uh, before we go into it. Or uh, maybe something specifically uh, about Airbus and what they look for in specific uh, characteristics. Um, you know, you always hire the person and then train them into their career. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. So if you think about it, we're looking for, let's be very fundamental. You need skills, right? And you're here learning skills. But no one, no one, including me or others in our organization, run the organization by ourselves. We build teams. So we're looking for people that can work together with other people and help other people be better. Does that make sense? Because if you're helping other people, you've really built a team. So you're bringing technical skills, but the question is, are you building on those technical skills? 
You don't, you know, sometimes you sit there and you, you what's the old saying? Um, if uh, always do something, you know, do it well or don't do it at all, right? And I would argue if you're going to do something, you can do it poorly. Now, I know deans over here are going to pass out. But the reason I say that is things that are really hard, when you stretch yourself, you don't, if they're that, if they're really hard, you're not going to be good at it to begin with, by definition. So it's okay to do it, quote unquote, poorly. Now, you don't want to continue to do it poorly. But one of the things I, I think that's really important in career building is stretching yourself. And sometimes that's not comfortable, right? When I look at my career and I, you know, I went to, to Cessna, um, geez, I didn't have a pilot's license, but they, they had faith in me and I stretched myself and, and solved that issue. Then I went to work building a, a uh, commercial aircraft business and by the way, the only th reason they thought I knew anything about commercial aircraft was because I went to Embry-Riddle. But they didn't realize the difference between general aviation and commercial aviation, so my wife bought me a book, right? So I'm looking at pictures of airplanes to understand how it all worked. The good news was that I had people that were willing to help me. And it's, that's back to that teamwork and Willing, you build that trust and you build that relationship. And it's amazing, amazing what it'll do for you. So I would, I would say we're looking for people who are skilled, willing to stretch themselves. Um, we, we are a multicultural company. Uh, one of the really cool things about Airbus is when you go into a room, it, it looks like the United Nations. It truly does. And here in the U.S., it looks like the United Nations because we're really proud of that. We want people with different ideas, with diff coming from different cultures, um, different economic backgrounds, different gender. You know, everybody has a different lens, right? We grew up and, and learned to think through our lens. When you have a, a different lens, you add to the discussion. Right, I, I could hire people that, that look and think the way I do, and what do you think the answer would be? Be the same thing that I was thinking, right? That's not necessarily helpful. But having a team that's quote unquote different and willing to engage in intellectual debate about different issues, I think is what's really important. Now, they, it has to be um, knowledge-based intellectual debate. But I think that's what we're looking for. We want people to grow. Um, the other thing is, how, how many people here get up? Well, let me ask the question differently. How many people here think they're really good at what they do? We got one, two, so three. So now how many people think they're really bad at what they do? Okay. I've never got that before in this question, but that's okay. And, then, uh, and how many people think they're average with what they do? Now, how many people want to be average in their career? Right? So you're all sitting here saying um, average, a couple people above average, and a few people below average, which is all fine. Question is, what are you doing to gain knowledge to improve yourself? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that was perfect. I was just going to ask about, um, you know, what we can be doing now in order to continue growing. Because that doesn't just stop, you know, once you enter the industry. You're continuing growing if you want to, you know, be successful. I would, Maddie, I would say it's the start when you, when you get into industry. What... Embry-Riddle is going to give you is a phenomenal foundation. It will give you a great foundation to build on. But it's up to you to build the house. And if you wait for people to bring the lumber to you and then all the fixtures, it's going to be a long road. 
know, I, I, I like to tell this story. When I had my first job, um, my second job, excuse me, um, with a leasing company, which was called CIT at the time, um, it, my commute was close to two hours each way, right? Two hours. Now, I, I did that on a bus. How many people think that's a good plan? I will tell you it's the single best thing that happened to me in my career. Now, at the time, I didn't necessarily think that way. Because what I did is I made it a point to read each way. So I would read four newspapers a day. I would read every trade journal. Aviation Week was one, but Flight International and on and on. And some have changed, BCA and the like. And over the course of a year or two, I got up the learning curve like this. Because how many people were taking the time to read four hours a day and go to work for 10 hours a day? Does, does that make sense? So it was a really, quote unquote, it was a tough situation, but it really, really advanced my career. And because I worked in New York for a long time, the commute improved, but it was always like an hour and 10, hour and 15 that I found to be exceptionally productive time because it allowed me to gain all that knowledge that you can't get in the office when you're fighting battles every day. Does that make sense, Maddie? Yeah. No, that's incredible advice. So I really, really appreciate you sharing that. Um, shifting gears a little bit here, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Airbus. Um, so, as, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as students, this is a, you know, a company name that we're hearing almost every day in our classes. Um, so I'd love, uh, I would love to hear you, kind of your uh, perspective of the, what the company is. You know, tell us who Airbus is sure. and you know, what operations you guys deal with. Sure. So um, I would define us as a global company with European roots. Now, that being said, you've just heard that Mobile, Alabama is the fourth largest aviation production facility in the world. If you look at what we will be producing in the next two, three, four years in the Americas, just on commercial airplanes, we could be producing 20 to 30 airplanes a month, a month. So the opportunity is huge. And, and uh, the dean had mentioned that we have 5,000 employees in, in the Americas. We're actually up over 8,000. So we are growing. We hired another, we hired between Canada and the U.S. 3,000 employees last year. We'll probably hire 1,500 new. Across Airbus, we hired 15,000 people last year. 138,000 employees. So we were the, the little engine that could, right, for, for a long time. It's a 50-year-old it's a company, but it was a small company. You go back to the late 90s on the commercial side of the business, we had about a 17% market share. When you look at order books today, we're above 50%. So think about that. Our helicopter business, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, it used to be called Eurocopter. Now we call it Airbus Helicopters. We have on the commercial side, or you know, you look at Coast Guard operations, the orange helicopters, they tend to be all ours. That's about a 60% market share here in the U.S. alone and globally above 50%. And then we have our space and defense business. Who's ever used Google Earth? Typically, when you use Google Earth, you're looking from an Airbus satellite. We have a huge satellite business, imaging business, so to speak. Um, our, and we have a defense business, mostly the heavy defense businesses in Europe. But we're doing some really cool things, whether it be on the space side, cyber, and um, some other uh, less well-known, and will remain that way, things on uh, um, for the government and the like. So we're building, and I think it's, um, to me, I'm, I'm very happy where we are. That doesn't mean we don't have our challenges, Maddie, like, like every company. You know, we're, we want to make sure we get the best employees. Um, the aviation industry can be a little bit cyclical. 
We see what's going on in the economy. All those things are challenges, but I feel like we're really, really well positioned to succeed. Thank you. Um, I know earlier in your introduction, uh, Dean Solder uh, mentioned that you're a part of Airbus Ventures, which just as a reminder is um, an organization which scouts and invests in uh, early stage technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, what have you seen or uh, how do you see the industry changing in the next five to 10 years in terms of you know where it's gonna take us, what is it gonna look like? For our jobs, um, yeah. Your, your jobs being pilot jobs, or your <laughs> the so um, one of the the fun parts of my job is abs is being um, I think I'm actually chairman of Airbus Ventures at the moment, um, and the reason it's fun is you get to see people who are really entrepreneurial and come up with ideas that I certainly would never think about. Um, I, one of the first businesses I saw was something called Spin Launch. Has anybody heard of Spin Launch? Um, it, it basically is a, sub, uh, you know, a, a centrifuge that will take, it's intended to take a satellite, you put it on this long arm and it starts to spin and spin and then it tilts and it's spinning so fast that it will release and if it's done correctly, the satellite will go into orbit. Right, so that's not something you see every day. Um, but what that does is allows us as Airbus to start thinking about different ways to approach issues, right? That's a different way to approach the launch issue. So we're, we're trying, Ventures as an example, gives us access to different technologies that we may not have had on our own and we invest in them, um, we are very collaborative with the companies, and it, it's worked out really well, and I'm, I'm really happy um, where that's taken us. In terms of, of technologies, a lot of people like to focus on autonomy, um, especially those of you who want to be pilots. Um, let, let's start with this. Um, you know, the improving technology on airplanes for as long as I've been in the industry, has been nothing but an improvement to safety. Fundamentally has improved the safety of the industry. And I think that'll continue um, as, as we go forward. We were, as you know, the first, many of you know, um, the first commercial um, airline manufacturer to bring in um, the side stick. Um, to, you know, the, to, to bring in a lot of different technologies. And all of those have been, I think, helpful. And we're not the only one. The name of the game is to improve safety for the industry. Now, when people talk about autonomy, what we're doing is just raising the level of safety. Now, in X number of years, could, could an airplane fly autonomous, uh, autonomously? The answer is yes. By the way, we have tested airplanes, big airplanes, They've taxied, you know, lined up, blasted off, flown around, landed, gone back to the gate. It's, it is doable, but it's not our intent. It, the intent is to understand and improve the environment for pilots because pilots are central to what we view as the airplane of the future. Now, again, you go back when I started, not, well, if you go back early in aviation, um, in the, in the mid seventies, that was before I started, just to be clear. Um, there were five pilots in, in, in the cockpit. Any of you realize that? There were five people. There was someone who actually was a navigator who used a sextant to, to, uh, to chart the stars, to know where you were going. You had somebody for the, the throttle quadrant, right? You had somebody, an engineer, a flight engineer, making sure that all the systems were working. Then, of course, you had your pilot and co-pilot. Then you went to, well, we can navigate a little bit better. We probably don't need the guy looking at the stars, and that didn't work so well when it was cloudy. Um, so, so they eliminated that. And then it was, okay, do we really need somebody to work the throttle quadrant? Well, not really. The pilots can do that, right? You good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, just checking. <laughs> and then you sat there and you said, well, Airplanes are becoming so sophisticated, you really don't need a flight engineer. Everything comes up right in front of you. If you have a problem, it's right there. It tells you the sequencing of the issues and the like. 
So you really didn't need a flight engineer. But when all those things happened, everybody said, oh my God, it's, it's the end of the world. We're not going to have three pilots. Now we have two pilots and we feel really good about it. And it's the same when, you know, airplanes used to be four engines. Four engines. And then when they went to three engines, the DC-10 is an example, L-1011, people were like, ooh, we're really pushing the envelope. And then when we went to two engines, people thought, wow, that's good for flying around locally, but I'll never fly across the Atlantic or the Pacific. And here we are every single day doing that. So those types of advances are fundamental to the industry and what we do. And we're trying to always push that envelope, not necessarily to, to change things, but to improve things. So you were saying how the, uh, you know, the technology and the autonomy of the flight deck is still improving. Yeah. Uh, so you were kind of telling the stories of how, you know, the number of people in the cockpit were getting smaller and smaller. Do you see that in the future, even getting smaller and get down to one pilot or maybe none at all in the future? Well, one of the things that we've developed, um, the none at all is, is likely not in, in our lifetimes is my guess. Um, you never know how fast technology advances, but there, there's certainly a, a comfort level with having a pilot in, in the airplane. Now, one of the technologies we've, we've looked at is, as many of you know, when you're on long haul flights, you have to carry multiple crews, right? That gets really, really expensive. So one of the technologies we're looking at and have actually developed um, is that when you're in crews, the, the airplane will essentially can fly itself with the pilot sitting there and the other pilot can go take a nap. And so you have a pilot completely in control of the airplane and then the other pilot can come back and it just allows the crews to refresh themselves. Whether anybody were, would use that would be up to the airlines and the operations and the cert, you know, certification authorities. Our job is to bring forward those types of technologies and analyze them as opportunities. Again, those things have to be certified. Airlines need to say, that's something for me. Um, but maybe it creates a higher safety margin in the future. Thank you for that. Um, kind of shifting gears a little bit to um, how Airbus, um, their Airbus goals in terms of sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Airbus stated their goal to be net zero uh, by 2050. Mm -hmm. So I know you guys are huge on hydrogen powered aircraft um, and also SAF fuels, which is sustainable aviation fuels. Um, so I kind of want to hear about the current and future initiatives that you guys are you know, working on. Well, you covered some of them, but let's... <laughs> so... Um, it, it's really important. Sustainability is, is who we are. Um, you know, we like to say, um, you know, we're, we're about a, uh, Vanessa, how do we say that? We're a, uh, what's our mission? <laughs> That's it for a, 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 a safe and united world. So we're about, as, I couldn't remember it. That's why I asked you. But the, it's about sustainability. We're fundamentally, everything we're driven towards is, is about sustainability. So we're investing in R&T annually $3 billion a year. It's actually 3 billion euros, but close enough. So $3 billion a year. And a major part of that is towards sustainability. And some of that is towards hydrogen. Some of that is, is towards things like digitization, building the factories of the future, which will be more sustainable. Some of that is around building air traffic management systems that are much more efficient, helping in, with, with the regulatory environment to, to build these systems that will be more efficient, thereby build you know, more, um, you know, use less jet fuel. So there's, there's lots of things we're working on and lots of areas that we're trying to develop. But it's, it's complicated. It's hard. SAF is part of what we're doing, sustainable aviation fuels. It's a major part. It's certainly SAF will be around in, in our, my humble opinion, until at least 2050. Um, it is it's something that can really reduce the carbon footprint. But ultimately, we believe hydrogen is the answer because it really has a zero footprint.
Now, hydrogen is hard, but that's kind of what we do, right? You're in aviation. You do hard things. So we're working on it. We expect to be flying an airplane if, we, if this comes together and we'll make a decision, let's say 27, 28, 29, on a launch, we would expect an airplane by 2035. So that's relatively quickly. Now it would take years and years to turn over the fleet, probably decades, but we think that's an opportunity and we're working hard towards it. There's infrastructure issues that have to happen. There's lots of things that have to happen, um, but it's, it's something that's worthwhile because at the end of the day, we wanna leave the planet a better place than we got it, right? So we've got to work hard on it. I think our teams are aligned and I'm, I'm really, really proud of the things that we're doing um, and the intellectual capital and the money, but intellectual capital, in other words, all the effort to make it happen. So a um, lot going on. I hope that answered your question a little bit. Yeah. Uh, including by the way, direct, has anybody heard of direct carbon capture? You know, where you take take carbon out of the uh, air and you put it back in the rock, actually. Uh, we're working on things like that. There's there's a lot happening. Yeah. Well, I know there's a recent uh, new development and recent flight test of the new uh, A321 XLR. So I okay. if you can share anything a little bit about that, you know, what yeah. the development's looking like and how it will shift the marketplace once it's published. Well, it's, it's an airplane and it's fun to sell. Um, and the reason is it's it's just a great airplane. Um, it does what other airplanes don't, don't do. It can develop a point, it's a point-to-point -point airplane, right? So you don't have to fly into a hub, but it will fly 4,700 nautical miles. So at, if most of you, I assume, have been on A320 series airplanes, you know, the 320, 21, what we term single aisle. What this is, is a 321 is our longest of our single aisle airplanes, and we're adding a rear center tank to it. And we're working with the uh, authorities today to get it certified, which should happen relatively soon. Um, and that airplane will, I think, help to change the dynamic of the industry. Because instead of having to fly into hubs, you can do secondary and tertiary cities to secondary and tertiary cities or secondary and tertiary cities into hubs, if that makes sense. So it gives airlines and more importantly, passengers who likes going through big hubs. I didn't think so, right? So avoiding hubs is, is a really important um, piece of this puzzle. And I think it'll really help the profitability of the airlines and more importantly, satisfy the, the customers going forward. Yeah. Well, something, uh, last thing here to leave us off with, kind of circling back to the beginning about, you know, how to uh, be a successful leader. Um, so for the inspiring leaders, um, myself and everyone else here, um, I would love to hear uh, how it is to make a positive impact on the industry, whether that be in the aviation industry or, um, you know, just the world in general. Any last piece of advice? Look, first of all, um, I had a mentor. Um, I was really lucky. Uh, have, have any of you heard of uh, Herb Kelleher? Herb founded Southwest Airlines, and he would speak to me quite often. Um, and he would always tell me and remind me, the business of business is people, right? The business of business is people. So it's nice to be focused on a goal, but remember, we all do this together. And building those relationships are really important because companies aren't looking for a star. I'm not saying it's not, it's fine to be a star, but it's better it's much better to be someone who brings a team along because then everyone's better. So I, I would say focus on relationships. I talked earlier about gaining knowledge. I can't emphasize that. I, I, if I'm not reading those newspapers today I, and, or, I'm, or, or trade pubs every single day, I feel like I'm at a huge disadvantage that I'm gonna be making a decision without all the facts. So I'm always you know, waking up, okay, I've gotta read all this stuff. Um, even my wife wonders, but I do it on, on vacation too, because I don't wanna miss it. And the other piece of that is, and it's important, and I think you all likely have this, because you're 
you're here at Ember Riddle is having a passion for what you do. You know, if you don't, that doesn't mean you have to love what you do every day, right? That if you know, if it if it wasn't hard, they they you know they call it fun, right? So the the reality is, it's hard sometimes, but you want to be putting your energy into something you really enjoy at the end of the day. So don't be don't be afraid to work hard. And don't be afraid to be in situations that are difficult. You'll get through those. They happen. But keep pressing forward and be optimistic, to my previous point, about getting through things. You know, be the person that people can, you know, you're picking up other people, right? Not stepping over other people. You're picking up other people and helping the team go forward. I think if you do those things, that you, you will have the foundation to have a great career. And you, you are really, really lucky to be in this industry. And whether it's the commercial or GA industry, the space industry, helicopter industry, now there's the cyber, air traffic management, um, all these things are on the front end of the industry. And by the way, as you meet more people that are not involved in aviation. My wife says this all the time. Why is it when we go to a cocktail party, everybody wants to talk to you? And it's not my dynamic personality, trust me, because that's not it, and I don't have one. But what it is is people want to talk about aviation, right? Everybody wants to talk about aviation, and what about this airplane, and how does air traffic management work, and is that a satellite? And all these really cool things So you are in the middle of that. So just be thankful, in my opinion, that you're in a great place. You're going to learn great things, but it's going to be hard. You're going to have to power through it, and you will. But just remember, it will be, there will be parts that are hard, but that's intentional, right? That you've got to learn learn to overcome and be optimistic that you will, because there's no doubt you will. Speaking of wanting to talk about aviation, we'll go ahead and open the floor up to anyone who has any questions. Uh, we'll go by the raised hands. And... Ooh. I, there's a question. Is Do I know how to uh, put my cap on my water without drowning? Hi, right, go, go ahead. So uh, what are the lessons learned from the A380, the good and bad? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, what are the lessons learned from the A380, good and bad? And how did Airbus catch up with Boeing in such a short time? Um, so lessons on the 380. That's your question, right? So has anybody in, in the room flown on the 380? Well, that's great. Uh, universally, the airplane is loved by passengers. It really is. Um, and there are certain airlines like Emirates that have made great, great use of the airplane. The problem is that it was a little bit late to the market. Engine technologies changed in the middle, right? So it ended up with not the latest engine technology, a good engine technology, but not the latest. Um, And all of a sudden, fragmentation starting to occur. 7.6, as an example, A330 on our side. And that started pulling traffic away from hubs and airlines Certain airlines, and Emirates said, I'm going after it. It's done exceptionally well. Others said, I want smaller airplanes. Hence why we went after the 321, which really fills that gap. So it was a learning experience. Um, 380 is a great airplane. There's hundreds of them out there today. um, And they'll stay around for quite some time, is my guess, because they're being taken out of the desert after after COVID. Um, You had another part to your question. I'm sorry. Oh, how did Airbus catch up with Boeing? Well, it wasn't that quickly. We're 50 years. Um, but what what happened, I think, is um, when you're not number one, you can be a little more. You're all you're more entrepreneurial, if that makes sense, right? And that gave us an opportunity to think differently, look at different ways of doing things. Um, Fly by wire is a great example. 380 was a, an, is another example. Um, 
220 could be considered an example, which is our smallest airplane. Um, it having being in the position of being behind sometimes has certain advantages because you can see the industry take shape and you know what you're aiming at. And I think I think the team uh, did a phenomenal job of of really pushing um, products. Great, I think. Fundamentally, if you're going to do well in, in any industry, you need great products, and I'm really proud of our products, um, and you need great people, and I think we've, we've done those two things pretty well. I have a slew of questions, Jeff, but I'll try to keep it short. Okay. Can you get us an FAA administrator? Number two, they want CVRs that run from two hours to 25 hours can that be downla downloaded as a software upgrade like Tesla's do? Number <laughs> Next question is, how much is the difference in terms of cost for an airline to, to just upgrade one of these things? And where are you on digital or video uh, cockpit recorders, which, you know, N NTSB would like to <laughs> so have? So you, you want me and the pilots union to get on the opposite side and battle this out. Is that the... So... So no, I, I, I get it. Um, I don't think any of these issues. Let's start with with uh, acting administrator Billy Nolan. Um, I know Billy well, and I'm a, a, a fan. Um, Phil Washington did not get appointed, as you know. Um, there's lots of it's, this is Washington. Um, I have n no idea who the administrator will be in the future. I think we're in good hands with Billy. Um, and until he either gets appointed as the, the full-time um, or someone else does, um, I think we'll be, we'll be in good shape. Um, relative to the questions about uh, cockpit data recorders, um, digital, I thought you were going with digital digitization, which I can talk about, but you were talking about actually video, digital video in the cockpit. And extending voice capacity. Um, look, I think it's, it's obvious that there's, it's not a technology issue. It's an issue that the airlines um, and um, the pilots and the like need to work out. And, uh, you know, we'll provide what they want. As simple as that. Uh, if, if they come back and say we want X n number of hours, we will provide X number of hours. If they want... Um, video, we'll provide, and you know, we have the ability, as you might guess, to, to figure out how to have video. Um, but it really is not our decision. It's the airline's decision, and it's it's the uh, uh, the pilot's decision. So um, that's that's really where that sits. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, you stated the hydrogen-based airplanes would be able to fly to 2035. Yeah. And that's also, our hope. Look, that you know, there's fingers crossed. You also just stated in one of your answers that customers were looking for smaller airplanes, and I'm assuming that's due to the issue of fuel economy and prices. They want something a bit more on the economical side. Say that um, again. I'm sorry. Uh, um, you stated in one of your answers that customers were looking for smaller airplanes, and I'm assuming that's because of uh, fuel economy and. Well, it's not prices. fuel economy. It's it's oh, okay. the it's it, in a lot of cases um, there there's a number of smaller airports. So what's happened is there is um, fragmentation that's occurred where people aren't necessarily always flying to hubs. So that has allowed the single aisle market to grow fairly substantially. We do think the wide body market is going to grow, but a lot of the wide body market that we see growing is the twin aisle market. For us, that's the A330neo up to the 350 1000. But that's still a 400-passenger airplane. I mean, it's not an insignificant airplane. So we, we try to offer a breadth of products um, across the board. Sorry, my actual question was, um, so would you, in your estimations, would you assume that these hydrogen-based airplanes are going to be more single aisle, more smaller? Do you think they're going to be more bigger? Do you think it's going to be a mix of they're, both? They're going to start single aisle, smaller, and it will evolve over time as the technology evolves. But you will see there's actually a hydrogen airplane um, that's flying today. It's not ours, um, but it's a small turboprop um, powered by hydrogen today. Um, so I think it's a Dash 8 uh, that um, Universal Hydrogen, the company is called, is flying today. So 
There's a lot going on in the space, but it will start on the smaller side and hopefully grow, grow in size. So quick question. If from all the Airbus products that uh, you offer, which one would you take home if you would have all the money in the world? <laughs> and why? Um, you know, it's funny because I was, as I, I mentioned at one, you know, one point in my career, I was one of the largest buyers of, of airplanes in the world. Um, so that gave me interesting views and access to information from the other side. Um, I, I just love airplanes. I mean, I, at one point in my career, I would have said the 330 and 330 Neo. It just was such a great airplane. Um, I do love the 350. Um, we talked about the 321 XLR. Um, that airplane will do things that even the 321, basic 321, that most airplanes won't do. So I love that. And then, you know, we're with the 220, um, which we really haven't talked much about. Um, which is our, our smallest airplane. And the 220 is really, in my opinion, um, gonna, this is an airplane of the future. It's a wonderful airplane. Um, it's a 100 to 150 passenger airplane. Um, and it's, it's, when you walk in it, it's got a great cabin feel. And it's also really, really fuel efficient. So it's got some great things going for it. So the answer is I'd buy a lot. <laughs> So on the topic of all these new airplanes being developed, uh, you're going to need pilots to test them. Uh, how often is Airbus hiring test pilots, and what are those qualifications that a pilot would need to get this uh, job if they were looking into going to that part of the industry? Um, I can't tell you what our specific test pilot qualifications are. Um, and there's different levels of test pilot, by the way. You know, we, we have um, pilots that will fly airplanes after they're built, um, we have test pilots who are flying airplanes for the first time that they are designed. Um, so I would, we can get, I want to get back to you with the, the right answer in terms of qualifications, but it's significant. Um, I would just say that, you know, if you think about what it takes to be a quote unquote test pilot, we want people that have a lot of experience, um, sometimes even engineering degrees also. Um, that combination is what allows the whole process to be safe. So that experience, I think, is, is what we'll look for. I can't give you the amount of hours. I just, I just don't know. But it's a big number. Let me just first say thanks for taking the time to be here um, and spending the day with us. Um, sure. you, we talked a little bit about the future and the long term. I'm curious about the short term, though, and this may be bit too technical of a question, so no need to answer, but um, it's an FAA reauthorization year. And yeah. There's a lot of talk about what's going to be in that bill as far as new technologies, improving safety. It's been an interesting few months uh, as far as close calls go. So um, what is Airbus looking for from Congress in the FAA reauthorization bill this year? Is there anything specific or big picture Look, we're, that you're looking for? We're obviously supporting um, all the efforts of of the airlines to improve safety, uh, whether it's in air traffic management or the airplanes themselves. Um, I'm probably not gonna regale you with all the specifics because it gets pretty technical, um, you know, from uh, double cockpit doors to, you know, very technical issues on avionics. Um, but I would say we look at things, one, does it improve safety? And two, does it help the airlines operationally? Um, and three is there passenger benefits in the process. And when things like that align, we we very we're very interested in those. Thank you. Um, so I got another question here. Uh, what is your outlook on the Latin American market for Airbus, and what is the biggest challenge in this region in your estimation? Um, we love the Latin American market. We have a pretty significant market share, both on, on certainly on single aisle and, and wide body is not bad. Um, I think the opportunity there continues to, to grow. Um, it depends, you know, people talk about Latin America like it's one big country. Um, I think we all know it's not. You know, the opportunity in Panama is different than the opportunity in Chile, than it's different than the opportunity in Brazil than the opportunity in Colombia, right? And they're all at 
different places. Um, I feel good that almost every one of those flies Airbus product, so that's good. Um, but there is, there's a lot of growth potential there for a couple different reasons. The economies are still emerging market economies. That means the growth rate of the economies is typically higher. Um, to the po there's po positive population growth, which, you know, people don't look at this, but in certain countries, there's not positive uh, population growth. That makes it hard to have economic growth. So that combination is, I think, um, you know, very powerful. And I think the Latin American market will, uh, excuse me, continue to grow. <coughs> My apologies. Um, Look, I think the biggest challenge is that the, um, the markets themselves have been very choppy for my entire career. Um, and the, the fundamental issue is the underlying economies in most cases, um, and in some cases currencies, have also been very, very volatile. And it's hard sometimes to build industries or businesses in those environments. But the macro, back to my original point, is pretty good. Uh, it looks good, but there are obstacles, and the obstacles have continued to be the economy. You know, you look at places like Brazil, um, which is, you know, what's the population there? Almost 200 million. Um, they don't have nearly enough airplanes uh, to, to uh, fulfill that. But the, the whether it's the real, um, you know, the, the weakness in the real and the strength of the dollar or um, issues specific to the economy in general have hurt it. Um, now, there are times it's on fire and other times it's not. So I think on average, it's going to be very good, um, but it won't, it won't be without a few uh, vacillations on the, on the way. Thank you. We probably have time for about one or two more questions. Um, I know there's like <laughs> it's up to you. I can do whatever you want. Hi, Mr. CEO. I have a little just fun question. Um, what are your airman certifications? Like, are you type rated on the Airbus A320? No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that was an easy question. I do love to fly the sim, though. I, I, uh, I, my view is if you're going to be a pilot, like you're, Maddie's going to be, um, be a pilot, be a professional, and do it all the time. If you look at what I do, I've got a full-time job, it appears, uh, running the Americas. So uh, being a pilot on the side is probably not the brightest of ideas for me. Maybe other people have that capacity, but not me. Thank you for uh, coming out and giving us the time today. But um, my question is, do you see uh, carbon composites coming into uh, narrow-body single-aisle aircraft? Um, and if so, when? Like, about what year would you expect that? You hear the question? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Hear. Do I, I see? Oh, composites. Yes. Yeah, composite oh, yeah. on, on narrow-body aircraft. When about do you expect that to happen? Well, you, you start looking at composite wings um, immediately. You can look at the, the 220 as an example of that. Um, I think... Obviously, when you're on wide-body airplanes, we're talking about composites today and have composites, um, a significant amount of composites in the, the uh, 350. So um, your point about the, the uh, narrow body is a good one. It's harder to do. It depends on, you know, composites have done a great job on weight. They probably, from a um, expense perspective, have not hit the targets that everyone had originally hoped. So there's more work to be done. Um, you're, you're seeing more aluminum alloys coming out that do really good things, and they're cheaper um, and have good reliability because reliability at the end of the day is critical to what we do. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Sure. You mentioned uh, having the capacity to learn as a major skill that has allowed you to scale from starting to sell airplanes to where you are right now. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what skill has allowed you to remain at the top where you've been? And does this same skill allow you to diversify to other industries, let's say uh, tech or energy industries, and thrive there if you, if you, if you choose to do so? So I think, I think the skill um, that you're talking about, maybe survival, 
um, at the top. But but beyond that is is really about management and building teams and understanding the fundamentals of business. So if you rise to the top of any business, you're going to need to understand accounting, right? Think about that. You know, businesses, it's nice to say I'm a pilot or I'm an engineer and all these things. And by the way, we have over a thousand engineers right here in the Americas that work for, uh, there's a pitch, um, that, that work for Airbus. And, you know, you need to also understand the business aspects. I talked about one aspect and that was human relations, right? Understanding how to build teams. Um, you need to understand some things about um, I am, or IT, as some people refer to it, um, how that works, um, how to set goals for people, you know, to pull a company together, um, quote unquote, management in general. All those things are part of the rounding process to, be, to become an executive. But once you have that, in many cases, it is transferable. You know, you can take that knowledge and use it in other industries. Obviously, you have to relearn some the basics of, of an industry, but accounting doesn't change in most cases. Some There's anomalies in, in certain accounting issues, but generally that doesn't change. Certainly the human dynamic doesn't change. So I, I think you, that's one of the reasons that I think universities and Embry-Riddle is at the top, certainly in aviation, um, gives you a good foundation. I used that term before, but you have to learn things beyond just, I want to fly. You know, you, there is some history involved. Um, one of the things I like to talk about, and I'll take a second here. Um, you know, when I sit down with a CEO of an airline, let's say, very seldom am I sitting there pitching it an airplane. Now, at the end of the day, I want to sell an airplane, right? That's kind of what we do for a living or a satellite or a helicopter. But we're usually talking about global dynamics. What do you think is going to happen with the economy? You know, the, there's the IRA now, Inflation Reduction Act. Anybody hear that? Okay. There are things you want to know about. And how does that affect business? How does that affect there's $350 billion in that bill for the environment, right? How do people gain access to that? All of these things go beyond the narrow aviation space and are broader, but things that affect business. Does that make sense? So you have to have a knowledge base broader than the industry you're in, but also can talk about, you know, economies, politics, those types of things. I try to stay away from politics, but at least uh, at least have knowledge of who's who. And anything else? Hi. Um, uh, thanks, thanks again for uh, taking your time and effort to bring with us today. You sort of already touched on the questions uh, I had earlier is that um, because of COVID, it really slowed down the production time of uh, all the entire aviation industry. Now we're in the rec what we call recovering phase of yep. the, um, the, uh, the industry, but now we're hitting all this the high inflation and then as well as interest rate. I'm just wondering how does Airbus uh, modify any strategies to encounter all those obstacles? Well, uh, it's, it's a great question because it's the question um, that we spend probably most of our time on today. Um, everybody's heard of supply chain. And, you know, there's, there's the supply chain has not recovered um, in the same way in all places and in all industries. So what we're trying to do is figure out ways to make sure that the system works better as this recovery has gone much faster in terms of demand than anybody anticipated. You know, in, in 2020, I was sitting with airlines and the discussions were, we don't need airplanes. We need to push out airplanes, right? But we have no passengers. We all saw that. Now, when you go to an airline, it's, when can I get my airplane, right? And you, this doesn't happen overnight. It takes, you know, 18 months to a couple of years to build an airplane when you start looking at some of the various parts. So it's a complicated system. The good news is demand is robust. I'd much rather be 
as much as it's not a lot of fun trying to, you know, get, get a production system, supply chain completely organized with disruptions, it's a challenge that you have to overcome. And we were working really, really hard to do it. I think we're getting better at it every single day. And one thing I'll tell you is it beats the heck out of having nobody on airplanes. You know, I'd rather have too much demand and all the problems that come with that than no demand. So there's lots of work to be done. I think the industry has learned a lot from COVID, um, supply chain issues, how to manage supply chain issues. And I can tell you, we're a better company today because of it, but we have a lot more to do. Well, Jeff, I appreciate you taking the time to sit here with us today and share your expertise. Um, and I hope you guys all have a great start to your aviation meeting. Thank you, Maddie. Great job. You were terrific. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to, I'd like to add my thank you. And how about a big hand for Maddie? I thought she did a great job. Jeff, as always, you are phenomenal. Thank you so much for coming and kicking this off for us. And everybody, like Maddie said, we have great activities for Aviation Week. So continue coming. You're going to enjoy it. Get a lot of benefit out of it. So thank you. Have a good evening.